Today I'm going to combine um, the leg class that we would have had last month, but the weather interfered. And so um, that's where this little handout that you have here, jump into self-care for your legs. So we'll just kind of start with that and kind of briefly go down and then we'll tie that right into the foot because it's all attached. Okay. So I'm, I put this together because in my years of practice, I've kind of boiled down to what I've seen for physical therapy then as um, three, the three S's. If you can kind of think of the three S's for yourself and apply them in your daily life with your activities, you can oftentimes eliminate a lot of pain before it really sets in. Because pain to me is your check engine light. So when your body starts to be overstressed in some way, with a muscle tightness from just even a simple activity like now when we're coming into spring, potentially raking, uh, pulling weeds, gardening, uh, picking up branches that have been blown all around. Now that repeated bending and squatting and such, you might not start to notice some soreness in, in your back and maybe into your lower legs. And so when we start doing squats, we're using the glute muscles, the quad muscles, a lot of the calf muscles and such. And all those muscles function like ratchet straps. And so let's go to this page because that will kind of lead into how, what I'm talking about here. If you look at this on the bottom of the foot page here, you'll see that this is showing a hip joint. And then it shows a muscle attached to the femur, which is your thigh bone. And as you notice there, the muscle attaches by the tendon, but you'll see that that muscle is made up of bundles. And then those bundles are made up of fibers. And then the fibers are made up of filaments. And then the filaments break down into smaller bundles and myofilaments. You can see that red one surrounded by four blue ones at the end there. Well, under microscope, there's actually six that surround that red one. And that red one is called a myosin. And then the white ones, those myofilaments, they're the blue ones there are called actin. And so under microscope, it's really neat because the diagram shows that the myosin will come in and it's got like six little propeller, pro propellers sticking off the two ends. And then those two ends are surrounded by those actin fibers. And those propellers then, when we tighten a muscle and the muscle shortens, those propellers have little hinges on them. And so the myosin then will attach when calcium is released from, there's a little picture here, it's kind of neat. You can see this, what they call the sarcoplasmic reticulum here. That's sort of a plumbing system down in that filament and myofilament area, and it releases calcium, and the calcium will seep into the, the filament and attach on the actin fiber and energize it. And so then that myosin pod uh, is, con is drawn to connect to that actin fiber, and it bends, releases, bends, releases, and connects and, and works just like a ratchet strap. And so we have these chains, as you'll notice, that um, it's, this one isn't as hard to see, but I encourage you to, with Google, Google muscle fiber, and it'll break it down into different pictures like this. And you'll see that these sarcomeres, that's what that little length is called, are little links in the chain all the way up that fiber and that filament. And so all of those little links are going chink, 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 just like a ratchet strap. And what they don't do is they don't push themselves back out. When we relax a muscle, those connections just release and then it just sits there. Okay, so if I'm with normal movement, if I bend my elbow right now, I'm gonna turn on my bicep and it's bending the elbow. The brain in turn is turning off signal to my tricep, which then is disconnected and now as I'm bending my elbow, the motion is pulling all those little ratchet straps apart on this side, okay? And so that's happening anytime we move. When we move in one direction, the muscles that are bending my hip right now are shutting off the muscles on the backside. So now the glute, which extends my hip, 
is relaxed and it starts to lengthen. But it'll only lengthen as far as the movement will take us, okay? So when we start looking at the leg, one muscle that I really talk, show people to stretch is the quad muscle, and that's basically bringing your heel up to your buttock. Most, a lot of people can't quite touch the buttock with the heel, um, and it's because they'll feel tightness, but more importantly, they may feel that tightness right down the front of the thigh. And that's because when we, you might be able to touch your buttock with your hip bent, which is stretching the main part, which is what we do when we get into a squat or when we're getting up and down from a chair. But to touch your butt with the heel and your hip straight, that requires stretching a muscle that we call the uh, rectus femoris that actually attaches, similar to what this muscle is showing you here, up on the, right up on the, it actually attaches on that little bone right there, this little knob on the front of the pelvis above the hip joint. So when the hip is bent, you're stretching this muscle, you're not at all really getting that long one until you start to bring that thigh back and then you'll start to feel a stretch right down the center of the thigh. And that one's important because it when you can release that, you can do that laying on your side, you can do it laying on your back and let your leg kind of hang over the edge of the bed at first. And then you can take and wrap a little sheet or a, um, a belt or something firm that you can pull with, nothing elastic, because you want to be able to have some control and just be able to pull that leg and you'll start to feel that little stretch down the front of the thigh. And that one then helps to decrease pain that can originate through the kneecap because if that muscle gets too tight, the tendon itself, and actually I have the, this is why I brought this little model here. Okay, so here's your knee joint, all right. This tendon is coming off of that muscle in the front of the thigh. And it, your kneecap, and you can see here, is embedded in that tendon. And we call this the patellar tendon. And that patellar tendon attaches right here on this little knob on the front of the, the bone right here. So with the big guy, here you can see, here's your patella, and you don't see the tendon there, but it's attaching right on this little knob right there. So when this muscle gets too tight, from hiking, walking, climbing up and down ladders, maybe you're doing something where you have to get up and down, or even for instance, if you do do some gardening and stuff in the springtime, and you find yourself doing a lot of squatting, that muscle is gonna tighten up on you, and you might start to feel some pain and discomfort right in this area, or right around your kneecap. And so the first thing that I would do, like I said, if you start playing with the S's, is just try to get a little bit of a stretch in there and see what happens. Now I've had experience hiking through the woods where all of a sudden my knee starts snapping and popping. And it happened to be during hunting season and I didn't want that stepping on twigs sound. And so I stopped right there and just did gave myself a quick little quad stretch like that. And then off I went with no more snapping and popping. But that was my little check engine light to tell me it wasn't painful, but because I was creeping through the wood, I was using the muscles a lot more and that muscle had tightened up and then started to give me a little signal. And so even now when I just did that, you know, right now I can feel a slight discomfort in the top of my kneecap because that's another spot where you can feel discomfort from that muscle being tight is right up here in the tendon where it starts to tie into the top of the patella. So anytime you feel any pain right here, that's the go-to stretch I would try first to see if you can release the tension in that muscle and then eliminate the pain right away. The sooner the better, because it's, it's like if you take and bend the finger back, that's uncomfortable. But if I let it go, it goes away right away. But if I hold that for a while, the longer I hold it, the more irritable that tissue becomes, the longer it's gonna to take to respond, okay? So now going back to the three S's, the first one then is stretching for flexibility. 
And so we're going to go through a few different stretches that I give, I use myself all the time. And then I, I teach on a regular basis. And I try not to even use the word exercise anymore when I'm working with clients in regard to these stretches because it, it really isn't. It's just response to what your body's telling you, which is tension and discomfort if you don't pay attention to the tension. Okay. I'm just going to demonstrate the squat. See, to be in a squat flat-footed is going to require flexibility through my calf muscles so that my heels and ankles will bend far enough to keep me from falling backwards. I have to have range of motion through the knees and the hips to be able to get into this position. And then I have to have the strength to be able to lift my body weight up from that position. And then the third S is stability. Okay, you want to be stable so that I didn't fall off of this while I was trying to get up. All right, so the strength and the stability or the flexibility allow me to move, and then the stability allows me to do that repeatedly without, without loss of balance and um, a potential issue. Okay. So that's why no matter what it is, we started with the neck, we worked into the shoulder, down the back, and then this, this class is gonna include the lower extremities and the ankles. In any joint, it doesn't matter what it is, you wanna try to maintain some flexibility in all of those parts, and then the strength to move it, and then the stability to do your motions and your activities without hurting yourself, okay? So that's why I kind of wanted to start out with this because that addresses the issues. And then as we work on down, we can kind of move right in and end with the foot and then we'll talk more about that. So again, using the, the spine, I, on this one it's kind of nice because I give you all the different types of um, positions that you might have heard of and you can use to stretch your muscles. So we looking at the spine, stretching for flexibility, the standing, seated, yoga pose, back strap stretches. Anytime you bend forward, sitting in a chair, you're stretching out these back muscles. And what I see in elders a lot that have really tight because we're always using the back, these muscles get very tight and strong. I find that a lot of times people can't bend through the low back. They either bend through the upper back or they're bending through the hips and this low back just stays flat. And so we wanna have motion in that low back because when it's too stiff, that's what contributes to arthritis in the back and, um, and then even potential disc injuries and stuff like that. So having the flexibility then allows you to uh, be able to move your parts uh, as you need to. Strengthening there, the sit back, we'll just touch on that quick, is again, where you just lean back in your chair without touching the back, you'll feel that this, the old six pack, which I call the bicep or the trunk, will just automatically tighten as soon as you go past neutral. And then as that turns on, it holds you up and it'll actually shut off these muscles back here, your extensors, with a, a principle that we call reciprocal inhibition. So if I tighten this side, and that's what I was talking about, if I bend my elbow, the brain shuts off my tricep, which allows the elbow to move, my, to be able to bend. At the same time, it stretches the muscle, but it's actually turning off the dimmer switch, of the power to that muscle, when I turn this one on. So you can use that little sit back and sitting or standing to engage and use your stomach automatically. At the same time, shut this off. And then if you just roll into a stretch, now I just shut it off. The muscles relaxed a little bit more and it's more um, conducive to stretching out and pulling those ratchet straps apart. And then stability, in the, in the uh, spine then is using the pelvic tilt to find your neutral position, doing things like planks and stuff and holding your stomach and practicing some marching. Cause even right now I'm stabilizing my pelvis, my low back by just engaging the muscles while I move my legs. Okay. 
And so as you practice these, it becomes just second nature. And when you're lifting and bending, you're supporting and protecting your back and accomplishing the tasks that you wanna do. So moving into the hips, the hips and pelvis then, the pelvis is basically just a, a ring. And, but we've got muscles, many muscles, and I, I can't say off the top, I know that there's 19 muscles that control the foot and ankle, but I, off the top, I, I'd be shooting in the dark at how many muscles. You can imagine all the abdominal muscles, the thigh muscles I was just talking about all the way around the hip, the glute muscles here that come across the crest. So there's, you know, off the top of my head, I'm gonna probably say 20, 30 muscles that are attaching to the hips and the pelvis. And so some of the, for um, the strengthening activities that I use for the pelvis then, is like I showed you with the squat, I squatted down. So that is one ex exercise and activity that if you just get into the habit and you're in the kitchen or at a table, you can hold on to the kitchen sink and just squat down just as far as you're able to go, you're now going to start strengthening and exercising those muscles, okay? A study that I read many years ago, they, did a co they tested some college students then they, were, they used electrodes in their muscles and stuff to see what muscles were firing when you went into a full squat. And what they found is that when we go, when they go to a full squat all the way down, right now when I come up, I'm using my buttock, the glutes, and then right here at about 90 chair height, we switch to using the quads again, okay? And so if you think about some of the activities like the exercises of the 80s and 90s, abs of steel and buns of steel, okay? They were, they were addressing an issue that comes up from patterns, okay? So I talked a little bit about um, the tightness in the back and the weakness in the stomach, you know, because we don't really use the stomach as much as we should functionally. The chair to me is the worst invention that we've come up with. Okay, we don't use the stomach when we sit. So by just sitting on the front edge of the chair or even in standing, like I'm saying, as soon as you just lay back and notice that I'm not arching back because then that's jamming my joints in the, in the low back, those facet joints where the arthritis can occur. I'm kind of pivoting or hinging back on my, my hips and my knees. And as soon as I get past neutral, this turns on, okay. Going back to here, we're always using the back for activity, we, and so there's no stomach, all right? We sit down in the chair, we lay back in the chair, no stomach. When the stomach is weak then, because it's not being used, then we take over with our hip flexors, the muscles that I was just talking about a little bit ago, those hip flexors then we use for walking and stepping and climbing and stuff. We use those all the time. Now, judging by our ages and stuff, we're all pretty close except for you, <laughs> all right? Um, were you taught to when, do sit-ups with somebody sitting on your feet? Yes. Okay, so you're in that bracket, all right? That's a, that was a bad way to do it because why are your feet coming up? Because you're kicking in the hip flexors. And what are we supposed to be doing with sit-ups? Work in the six-pack. What are we doing then when that fatigues out and our feet are coming up? We're using those hip flexors to lift our body up rather than the legs. So now those muscles start to work harder because they're always being used. And when they get tight from overuse, what do they do? They reciprocally inhibit and shut off the glutes, okay? So now you get what we call a cross pattern syndrome of tight, tight, Weak, weak. And there's their abs of steel and buns of steel. They're trying to address it, but no, you didn't hear that explanation when they were promoting that much, did you? It's like, do this. All right, so, but that's, that's how patterns set up. So now, 
one, you get tightness in the hip flexors, and one of the muscles then of the hip flexor group is called the psoas or the tenderloin, okay? It attaches to the spine and on the inside of the thigh, oh, we don't, we don't have a thigh bone, but if you look at that, uh, at this little picture here, you can see underneath where this muscle is attaching, there's a little knob and that's where that hip flexor attaches. And so it attaches to the spine and then it goes down through the groin and attaches inside the thigh. It merges with one that lays on the inside crest of the pelvis and attaches at the same spot. So what was happening when we were doing a bunch of sit-ups and using the hip flexors, it started to produce low back pain. And so then they started to say, oh, don't do full sit-ups, do crunches. So now you're just doing a crunch, but you're only using part of the abdominal. You're not getting the whole thing unless you're taught to do like that pelvic tilt. And some of them, if you, um, there's, this is one of the ways, whoops, that's not going to work. Um, that's not going to work either, but it's doing a, like those hanging from a pull-up bar or those little things where you can hang on your elbows and you do just a pelvic tilt. So you're pulling the pubic bone up with the lower abdominal. That's supposed to be a pretty good one. And I play around with that because I've got a grab bar I threw up in my garage and I'll hang from that and wiggle around and stretch my back and do some of the tilts and stuff. And so that one is a way to get that lower portion. But the best way is to just actually sit in the long sit position legs out and then slowly curl yourself and let yourself roll back down. Um, here, I can, I can quickly show you that one because it all ties together. But so you're in this position and you just kind of roll yourself because no resistance. Now you're working into your max resistance right down here, which was why we were having issues with sit-ups because you're starting at max resistance, trying to lift your body up, and that's why your legs come up because we start to use those hip flexors. So if I'm gonna exhale here. So you see my legs came up just a little, but they didn't come up much because I'm focusing on using my six pack, the bicep of the trunk to curl me up rather than hinge myself up using like a jackknife in the hip flexors, okay? So with that then, how that then ties together is that when we get weak in the, ha in the buttock because these hip flexors get too tight, they then will cause us to overuse the back to try to straighten, or we start using the hamstrings to straighten our hips rather than the glute muscles. So then when you get down into the squat, you don't have the glute muscles to help get you up. And I hear it all the time. If I get into that position, I won't get up. And it's, it's very possible. But now I want to show you then when in this, uh, oh, here it is in this picture here. And I don't, this was just one I had at work today. But here's some of those little stretches that I was talking about. But this position here, you've heard of the yoga pose or the child's pose. That position, as you look at it, because I don't have to jump up and show you now because it's there, is that look at you're, you're bending through the hips and you're bending through the knees. So the only difference is, is he's not standing on his feet. So if you can get yourself into that position over time on your bed or on the floor, you start to develop this range of motion. So then the next step is then just working on your strength with the squats to be able to get up and down from the bed or the floor or the ground, okay? And I, I, it, it, to me, that's important because, I mean, you see it on TV, you gotta have that life button. I've fallen and I can't get up. Well, if you injure yourself, that's a different story but most of the time it's that people are just too weak to get up. All right. So the other little activities that can help with strengthening the glutes are a little bit of the donkey kick. All right. So just playing around, look at, it could be a kitchen counter or something. And, and notice that what I want to show, cause I'm paying attention to the, what I'm feeling. 
and that's what you want to do. You want to pay attention to what you're feeling. Don't just go through the motion. The term is present moment consciousness. Be in the moment. Eckhart Tolle writes about the power of now. And so when we're in the moment, we can pay attention to what we're doing. And if we feel that it's not hitting the target zone, then we can adjust. So one of the common mistakes with doing this is to arch through the back while you're doing it, okay? That can be an exercise, but it's also jamming those joints in the back again when your intention is to maybe strengthen the glute. So what you wanna do is you're using the stomach to maintain some stability over that low back while you just kick the heel up working on the buttock muscle. Another technique is just doing the standing and again, paying attention to not going too far through the back to do it, but just to focus on this part of the body right in through here, your glutes and your, your hamstring. Now, when you get good at that, then you can incorporate the full movement because there's a nice little um, stretching technique called the pendulum. And so you just kind of slowly work into that, but you see now that's going to go all the way up through the core in a sense. So it's just a nice rhythmic movement that can, you can tie everything together. But what I'm saying is that when you start any of this, start with the target zone. And when you feel comfortable with it, then expand it into the rest of the body. Okay. So, Let's see, where are we at here with this? Magic trick. All right, now, um, for strengthening, I talked about the squats, and I'm gonna talk next about the lunges. So when I say the two most, to me, the two most functional and practical strengthening exercises for the lower extremity is the squat. And I'll tell you this too, you can turn sitting down into the chair or even sitting down onto the toilet. I use the toilet as a reference because that's one where we always kind of think of, we call it a butt back squat. So you're, you're bringing the butt back instead of just dropping straight down. And now I will jump up here for this one because the butt back squat keeps the knees behind the toes, okay? It, we can tolerate doing squats like this to get into it and coming up, but a lot of repetition can put a lot more strain through the front of the knee and could potentially cause a little bit of meniscus issue or something, okay? So it's just nicer when you're practicing repetitions to just keep those knees more back towards behind the toes. So I call that the butt back squat, like you're gonna sit down on the toilet, but you can do that sitting down onto a chair and then just stand back up. And even what I'm doing now, I can start to feel fatigue already in my quads. And so with that then, I just follow up with a little quad stretch and now I'm releasing that tension, okay? So um, the other one then is the lunge. With the lunge, it's very similar. You just sink down and then you stand back up. Now you don't have to have your feet really close. In Tai Chi, we, they, we were taught about keeping a channel between your feet. So you can keep a little channel between your feet. If you were to look straight down at it this way, you're not gonna be on the tight wire. You're gonna have a little bit base. And if you need a wider one, stick them out a little farther. But the goal is just to sink down and you can literally get to where you touch the knee and come back up. And uh, what I like about this and why I find it to be an, uh, the second important leg strengthener is that I call it your stair stepper because as you're sinking down, this is going down the stairs. And now when you come up, you're going up the stair. So when you think about it, we're only using one leg to lower us down to the next step. And then we're using one leg to lift us up to the next step. So as you practice that and work into touching the knee eventually, you've just gone through your full range and you'll maintain strength for going up and down stairs. So I hear that a lot and to each his own. 
A lot of elders want to build houses and find houses with just a single level. Now you eliminate using stairs. Well, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so then when you're out in the public and community and you have to use stairs, it can be a challenge because you don't have the strength to get up and down those stairs. So yes, you can do the step two technique, which a lot of people will do, but it slows you down a little bit if you're in a hurry. Okay, but so stairs really aren't our demon. It's just another way that we can use to keep our bodies active. And a lot of times people just get weak and they just aren't, aren't challenging themselves on a consistent basis, okay? So that's kind of where I'm at right now is at 62, I just keep playing around with doing things to you know, challenge myself with balance and, and flexibility. And if there's something that I can't do, then I try to work into something like sitting cross-legged and stuff like that. And even the, that squat, when I first realized, you know, I was thinking about squats and I'd be in a squat position, I always had to be up on the balls of my feet because I couldn't do it flat-footed, I would fall backwards. That's when I started thinking about now, here we're gonna move a little bit down into the leg and if, you know, I hope I'm not losing yet, it kind of flows and such, but the calf muscle then is a muscle that we're using all the time. And so if we look at the calf here, I think it's knees and ankles here. Okay, so here we go. It's down in the ankles, but it's also in the knees because they affect both. So I'm gonna show you that one. That is the, the calf. There's two parts to it. And that's the neat thing about the muscles is if you'll notice, we've got muscles that only go over one joint and then like this, this rectus femoris I was telling you, that goes over two joints. Same thing with the calf. We get the, um, this muscle right here goes uh, over the knee. It's called the gastroc. It's the little double bumper. And that attaches above the knee. It goes down and ties into your Achilles tendon, which then is kind of going over the ankle, all right? So most of us were taught to do a calf stretch with this, or you put your foot up against the wall and do a little calf stretch. So, but you notice that the knee is straight. So you're getting the bulk of the muscles, but you're only limited to how far this gas rock will let you go, all right? So you stretch that for about 20 to 30 seconds. And I use the number 20 to 30 because that's um, another study that I read indicated when they were doing hamstring tightness, they took groups and they busted them up into subgroups. One group didn't stretch at all. Everybody had tightness, of course. The one group didn't stretch. One group stretched one 30 second stretch per day, every day for six weeks. And then it was two 30 second stretches, three 30 seconds, one minute, two one minute, and three one minute in one session, you know? So it'd be a 30 second rest, another 30 second, and rest, okay? They found that at the end of the study that, of course, the control group didn't gain any flexibility, but what they found is there was no significant difference between the 30 second and the three minute stretching sequence between the rest of them. So little things like that just stick in my mind that if you're gonna do a stretch, you just hold it at least once a day for 30 seconds, you're gonna make some ground. But I believe that whenever you feel the tension and you wanna get somewhere, you stretch it more frequently whenever you think about it through the day because stretches should not be painful. And if they're not painful, you're not hurting anything. All you're doing is pulling those uh, ratchet straps apart, okay? So with the knee straight, you get them. Now when I bend my knee, I get the deeper muscles that tie into the foot. I told you there were 19 muscles that go into the foot. 10 of them are in your foot. So that leaves nine up here through the top. And so these deeper muscles here then are, um, there's three of them that go into the foot. And then there's another part of the calf that ties into your Achilles tendon, the soleus. And so when you bend your knee and you stretch it, then you're getting that group. Okay. And that's what I found I had to do in order to 
develop the ability to do a flat-footed squat, okay? Because I'd, I didn't have the flexibility in the ankles, so then I'd have to just roll down into this position, which then started to bug the balls of my feet. So then when I started stretching, see, now it allows me to be in a flat-footed position and, and stable, okay? Now, I took that one step further because I'm a sequence kind of guy because I like things to just flow. So you start with the calf stretch straight, then the knee bent, and then if you roll your foot over and just curl your toes, now you're stretching the shin muscles, which how many of you stretch those on a regular basis? Good, excellent, because that is what I find can lead to bunions and corns and stuff like that, hammer toe and stuff, because these muscles we're using every step we take to keep the foot from plopping down, and so those muscles are functioning, and if we don't stretch them out, they get tight, and then they start pulling through there. So think of your foot and your ankle as like your wrist, because basically that's what it is, except that when, we're, we're, when it forms, instead of just sticking out like our hand does, it sticks and then it rotates around and creates the flat foot that, or the, you know, the surface that we walk on, okay? but it's the very same structure with the muscles over two joints and many joints and then the muscles that are just going over the wrist and hand joints okay so we get muscles that are attaching here and then we get muscles that are attaching down here on both sides that bend and extend our fingers and, and the same with their toes when I crunch my toes and make a fist, which I encourage people to do all the time, do it in your shoes, grip, play around with that. You're turning on the muscles in the bottom of the foot and then you're turning on the long extensors that come into the leg. And then the same with extending the toes. When you bring those toes up and pull your foot up, now you're using the muscles in the top of the foot and you're getting the muscles in the shin. So that, that's tying into the flexibility part. And then with the strengthening, the strengthening would be for your feet doing those foot crunches to turn on the muscles in the bottom of the feet. All right, so back at the hips, um, I put together this little kind of what I call a four direction stretch in a way. And it's, it's really simple. Again, another sequence is that Oftentimes, most of our activity is in front of us. We're moving through life forward. We don't do a whole lot of sidestepping anymore unless you're a dancer or you do things that get you moving sideways. But um, a nice way then is to just step to the side and stretch the inside of the thigh because those muscles we're using, and they oftentimes get a little bit weak because we're not, we use these muscles more these muscles are being turned on all the time. This, this upper part of your pelvis here and then the outside of your quads because they're tied into our single leg stance when we're walking. So every step we take, we, it, you can even put your finger right there and you'll feel that muscle kick in right there. And that all ties into that IT band. Have any of you ever had IT band problems or bursitis, okay, hip bursitis? That's because this band starts to get too tight from the tension in the muscles here. And two things, one, it starts chafing over your trochanter and underneath there's a fluid filled sac called the bursa. And if the friction gets too great, it causes it to swell just like a blister. So then that gets full of fluid and then it's very painful to lay on it and then when you're walking. The other thing is that that band can get tight and where it's attaching down here at the side of the knee, that can give you some insertional pain down there, okay? So again, stretching is the first, one. well, two things. Now, I, I say that with the aha because the general consensus in physical therapy is to start stretching right away, all right? Well, I was looking it up one day, uh, perusing, and this one other PT really was talking about how instead of stretching right away, start working on strengthening these inner muscles of the quad. 
And to me, that made sense. I hadn't heard that approach before. And then with the concept of reciprocal inhibition, that's why it made sense to me because we're always using these muscles by default again. So another pattern starts to set up. Because these are being used, what happens to the inside muscles? They get reciprocally inhibited and they get shut off. And remember I just mentioned oftentimes they're weaker. And so if, we, if you have issues that are coming down the side, one of the nice activities to do for that is, well, start kind of bringing your leg across and start using these muscles. And you can do that. You know, I always think of don't just do one side kind of, Here's where that swing can come in. You come out and forward and backward because then you're using the muscles to move through a full range in a sense. You're not just using these hip flexors and moving it just to the front. You get the hip flexors moving at this time and then you get the, the adductors and part of the glute moving at this time, okay? So um, switching it up a little bit just adds more how would I say completeness to to the activity but the other one that's really a good one is um, this one here where you put one foot in front of the other and then you do these like inner thigh raises okay that one's a challenge even for me right now I'm thinking wow I guess I better do some of those pretty soon because it's feeling a little tight and a little heavy okay but what that's doing then is it's turning on those muscles and it's you're getting some reciprocal inhibition of the outer thigh and then the quad. And so um, going back to the stretches then, you step off to the side, you can stretch the inside of the thigh. And then if you just kind of rotate, you can get the front. Here you get that hip flexor I was talking about and a little bit of the um, quad here. And then if you cross over, you get the IT band, all right? And you wanna kinda of lean back because it's this muscle, the tensor fascia lata, right in the front that is one that really fires every, every time you step. And then the other portion of it is the glute medius right back here that comes up onto the crest and then down. And so I've seen this done, this is the way I show it a lot, but now I've kind of thought about another way that I've seen it where you kind of bend forward. So again, if you play with both of those, you'll find which one is tightest for you. And that would be the one you want to focus on just a little bit more. But I have found that when I do it this way, now I'm getting a little bit more of a stretch on this portion. And when I stand up and I lean out just kind of back and toward the side, now I get this tensor fascia lata and both of them will then help to stretch the muscle here more than the band. The band is more fibrous. The band is like a, a long tendon. And so you, you get some elasticity in there, but that's think of that more like a rubber band, whereas the muscle portion of it is your ratchet strap. And that's what you're after is just to let those little fibers gently pull apart. Okay. So um, so I had the inside, the front side, the outside, and now the back side is a stretch that I learned in a Tai Chi class in Denver one time where it's just keep your legs straight and maybe I'll show this one up here too. Alrighty. So you keep the legs straight and you just kind of come down. I will lay a hand on there. And you let this knee bend and you just drop down and you can get a nice little quick hand standing stretch that way. If you're out someplace and there's a tree or a rock or, you know, a wall or something, you can always do the one where you just throw your leg up there and put that up, you know, the heel one, rest it on there and get your hamstring stretch. But then that stretches the backside. So the four directions, inside, front side, outside and backside pretty much round out the stretches for the hip, which then keeps that hip nice and flexible and loose. 
Now, if you ever notice and talk to people with, or have seen with arthritis, where do you get the arthritis? You get it where that ball is riding on the top of the socket, which is our robot motion of doing this. So if we're only doing this all the time, we're only kind of working on the top of that joint. But when you start spinning and doing sidestepping and just dancing around in the kitchen for fun, then you start to lubricate the cartilage throughout the joint and that keeps it healthy and it's going to be less prone to deterioration. Okay. Arthritis by definition is inflammation, itis of the joint, arthro. And that's all it is. We've been taught that it's a death sentence. And yes, it occurs often because of what I'm saying. We don't pay attention to what our body's telling us. So when your hip or your knee or your elbow or your shoulder starts hurting, we're taught suck it up and no pain, no gain and, and get her done. And we're not paying attention to just letting it rest, do some stretching, calm it down and, and let it heal before we hammer on it again, okay? So again, repetitive strain and repetitive use are what cause the breakdown because the tissue can't repair itself faster than we tear it apart. So with that, lubricating the joints, drinking fluids at night, because at night that's when the joints, the cartilage are what we call hydrophilic. They absorb moisture and expand and replenish themselves like a sponge. Same with the intervertebral discs, you know, when, and then they, they expand. I mean, studies have shown that we're a little taller in the morning when we get up and we're a little shorter when we go to bed because we've squished out all the water in that, those structures and, of course, we shrink down, okay? So, I think that pretty much brings us down to the ankles and feet, okay? So, let's see, uh, this, is there any questions while I kind of peruse this a second? Here's another problem that arises at the knee that I see a lot with. It's, it's where, remember how I mentioned, and I'll just put my foot right here, that we tighten this part of the quad because of our standing. Now, I'm not sure, but I've seen with, um, with knee patients when I've worked on, uh, I had a summer once where I saw several many knee replacements and the common problem that lingered even when they were back to all their activities was ah, I keep getting a soreness right here on the inside of my knee and so I started sitting there thinking okay we're doing the stretches we're doing everything and they're doing the exercises and everything and it's I'm thinking why is that happening well I, I started to realize that the hamstring basically is three muscles that come off of the bone here that's what we call the ischial tuberosity or the sit bone, the one that you can feel. And it comes down in two of those three muscles, they split right away and they go to the inside to the hamstring or to the tibia and bend the knee here. The other one comes down and goes to the outside, the bicep femoris, and that's the tendon you can see right here that goes to the knee also, but that comes up here. And I found working with them that they were, when I had them do a hamstring curl and I would do a manual muscle test on them, that that inner hamstring was always really tight. And that's where it turned out that the tenderness was. There's a little bursa here called the pezanserine bursa. So at this point on the inside of your knee, you get, um, three muscles that are merging into a common tendon right there and then the bursa is underneath it again to reduce the friction from our normal bending and moving so one of those muscles comes off the pubic bone and goes straight down it's called the gracilis it's a skinny little muscle and that's so that's coming off the pubic bone the other one is the semi tendinosis which comes off that sit bone and the tendon is longer down towards the bottom here. And then the third one is what we call the sartorius that comes right off of this point you can feel on the inside of your hip and it wraps right around the inner thigh and attaches there. 
Now what those three muscles are doing is creating a tripod of support. So if I stand on my leg, it just doesn't collapse out on me. Okay, so we wind up using those and if they get too tight, it's going to create more friction on that bursa or tendon pull and it creates tendonitis, inflammation of the tendon. And that then is very painful and that's on the inside. Okay, so what I was finding then is that this muscle group here was generally stronger than this one here. So when we look at strengthening the hamstring, I would show people that have that issue how to do the hamstring curl, which is a nice strengthener. When we're standing up, all the resistance is coming in right here because gravity is going down. We don't get a whole lot of resistance here. It's more at the top. When we do this lying down, now the resistance is at the bottom right here. And then as we get into the bend, the resistance goes away because gravity is going down into the knee. And so it's not very hard to do it here. So this is a nice exercise if you find that you have some hamstring tightness or weakness, I should say, is to do it in laying. And you can put an ankle weight around it if you want to, if you have one, and then um, standing. And so in standing, you can do that. Now, to bias this part, if you turn your hip in, roll the hip in and then kick the heel out. Now notice I'm not twisting through the waist. That will put that leg out there and then you just toe tap out to the side and you'll feel immediately how that really starts to pull in this bicep femoris, which then starts to balance those two muscles out and give you more power and then take any irritation and tenderness off the inside. Okay. My favorite by all means is doing this lateral weight shift because you can put your fingers on there and when you shift side to side you'll feel that muscle just pop, pop, pop and you just go back and forth until you feel that fatigue and plus you're in kind of a mini squat or the horse rider stance and so you're already strengthening and using your quads so you're just making them a little stronger but you're biasing that inside of the knee. And you want to get that strong enough so that that patella then just, like I say, doesn't get pulled off to the side. It kind of comes up and then out just a little bit. And so if you don't feel any type of a muscle right there when you do that, work on that one. So that's where the lateral weight shift comes in for strengthening. All right, stability. Again, feet together. Uh, wide apart, one foot in front of the other, single leg stance, all these things. If you play around with practicing that, you're slowly, you're working on the stability portion of, you see how I can move around without bobbling too much? It's because I'm, I'm, I play with this stuff all the time. All right, so knees, uh, strengthening the squats again, two-legged, one-legged. I was in Finland and met some relatives and I met their son, um, uh, Tonnelly, and the young man, he was like, what was he, maybe 17, 18 at the time. And in Finland, all the men have to train for military because it's just part of the, you know, national security. And so he wanted to be a paratrooper and we were out on a hike and he showed me this gravel pit. And what he used to do is he'd put 50 pounds in there, he and his buddy in a backpack, and they'd run up the side of this gravel pit and, I mean, loose, and then just run up there. And then we were uh, in his room and he did judo and he had like a flight suit and he had it stuffed with all these heavy carpets and stuff. The thing must have weighed 160, 180 pounds and he'd throw that thing around. But what impressed me the most is when he dropped down and did 10 single leg squats, <laughs> okay? I thought, holy cow. So I get back to the Minnesota and I was working up at the reservation and, and um, we had you know one of those cable column machines. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna work into doing, see, I told you I tried to challenge myself. I forget, I must, I'm 62, I was 50 something. And so I, I put some weight on there just enough so that it would help me pull myself back up. And then I just started working on single leg squats 
and then I would slowly decrease the weight until I could at least do one. So the next time I went over, I said, look it, I can do one. <laughs> so there again, it's strengthening. It's just challenging yourself when you find that you have a deficiency that you want to just take care of, okay? Um, so stretching, I got you the heel to the buttock with the hip straight, hamstring again, calf stretch, knee straight, IT bands, oh, stability here, that horse rider stance, you know, that was, a, I started Taekwondo when I was 16, that didn't last very long. And so, but I learned the horse rider stance and the knuckle push-ups from that. And then um, that one's good, your, your lateral weight shifting, single leg stance. Um, and then the ankles and feet. So let's pull out this guy here. And I did bring a foot because this part here, look at the, the, when I talked about doing the, what are we doing? Oh, we're doing okay for time. All right. As you notice, I can be a little winded. <laughs> um, the foot has three natural arches to it. The inside arch, the outside arch, and then the, the middle arch, okay? Those are natural, the bones, just like some of these cool buildings with the arched windows, what do they do? They've got stones that are fit to support themselves for the most part, and that's what all these bones are designed for. The problem with our society now is that we've been taught to, as soon as we stand up, what do we do? We get put in shoes, okay? No shoes, no shirt, no service, all right? So we're taught, oh, don't go barefoot, all right? Yeah, well, you gotta be careful with anything, but I encourage barefoot in the grass, in the sand, I mean, walking on, well, even walk Park Point's a little dangerous now with all the stuff that's drifted up there, but um, barefoot in the sand, using your feet, crunching, we, they were designed to grip and clutch the earth. Now, plantar fasciitis is one of the issues. Anybody had plantar fasciitis? Okay. Yeah, it's no fun, is it? All right. I haven't had it bad because I've learned about treating them. And when I was treating them, I'm thinking, okay, why is that? So that's when I started doing and talking about doing those foot crunches. So grip in your shoe, grip the earth, do that all the time because I have had flat feet and after I started doing that, uh, what I'm doing is I'm strengthening those muscles that help support my arch, okay? So what you want to do is you want to do the foot crunches and you want to practice rolling your ankles outward. It's, this is called pronation and this is supination, like holding a soup bowl or a soup can, all right? And so the same with the feet. When we kick our feet out this way, that's pronation, that's flat-footed. Our arch gets crushed and it's laying down. When we kind of pull our foot like we're trying to curl it up, that's supination. So what I do is I'll crunch my feet and I roll my ankles. I kind of do a combination and that's strengthening and supporting my inner arch. Now I also recently read a few years back about Remember when I was talking about the muscles that are in the deep calf? Okay, there's three of them. This one that attaches on this bone here goes right through the inside of your bone. Let's see, nope, let's go this way because this is your tibia. It's laying right here and it goes right underneath, underneath and it curls your toes. So that's your um, flexor digitorum longus, okay? Then in the middle, on, there's, a, there's a fibrous membrane that we call the interosseous membrane that connects the two bones together with a few openings for veins and arteries and nerves to pass through. But it's a very fibrous, almost like strapping tape. And, and when people, you know, uh, break their ankle down here, sometimes that can get separated and that's very, very uncomfortable. But attached to that is the opposite of this muscle. This is the tibialis anterior that pulls your foot up and it connects down here on the inside of the arch is the posterior tibialis, tibialis posterior. That comes down here, goes underneath and it attaches on the bottom of the foot here. And then there's one other little muscle that's attaching right here. It's called your 
Halicus longus, flexor halicus longus. It comes down, dives underneath your Achilles tendon, comes right down under this hook of the um, navicular here, and then it goes right down to your big toe, and it's one muscle that will curl your big toe, okay? And that then goes right under here, and I've, I was reading where they were showing that that is part of your ankle support, because, or your arch support, when that muscle's strong enough, it then provides like a strapping tension that helps hold the arch up. But when we go to a podiatrist or a foot place, what do they do? They immediately want to put you in arch supports, which is good, but to me that's just a cast or a crutch. And most of us will just then use arch supports for the rest of our lives instead of working on developing the muscles to help support the arch, okay? So that's if, um, for if I, I sometimes will have a zinger of plantar fasciitis, if I've been hiking or climbing on the ladder or working on the roof or mountain biking, you know, cause you're using a lot of, that's why my calves got so big. I used to do some mountain bike racing and such. And so, you know, the pedals locked in on my forefoot. And so you get really tight through the calf muscles. And so if I start to feel any bit of a zinger in there, I immediately crunch my foot and I just go right into that calf stretch right off the bat, okay? So I'm, I'm supporting the arch of my foot with the crunch, turning it out a little, and then I'm stretching the calf muscle to increase some length and ten, uh, release the tension in there and immediately the zing goes away, okay? If I don't, then it would just get worse because I've let it do that too, but I don't like that. So I just do it right away. Okay, now we talked a little bit about um, um, the plantar fasciitis. Any questions with that? I don't have it anymore. Yeah. I, I did get a, a foot. Uh, Orthotic? Yeah. Yeah, and by all means, I'm not dissing it in any way. I just, I just say that that's the common thing. And then as you're using it, I still encourage you to use it because see, then if you you don't have it with you and you're in some other shoes or something, you're gonna be less likely to really aggravate it that much more. I ended up getting an injection. You got what? Injection. Oh yeah, yeah. It was so bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, I've, I've worked on a guy, I mean, when it gets really bad, it's hard to really reel it in. The other thing is ice bottle, you know, rolling the ice bottle under there, freeze a pop bottle. So, um, I also have had plantar fasciitis in the past, but, and I wear orthotics, I've done it for like a million years. Yeah. But I find that my ankles lock up, and sometimes my, my toes do, mm -hmm. and my chiropractor will adjust my toes, mm -hmm. and I know they also adjust my ankles. So why, how, how do they get locked up like that? I mean, you know, I wear hiking boots all the time because I hike a lot. Yeah, on how much ankle stretching do you do? Not much. Okay, see, yeah. I mean, and, and I, I, that's why I ask because it's my feedback too because it helps me be able to say that if, if you're, from my professional opinion, that's part of it is that the muscles get tight and these joints are only controlled by gravity, pressure, and then how the muscles are moving them, okay? And so that's why if the muscle's pulling too far on one side, it's going to pull that joint off a little bit and then it's going to be um, potentially catching because it's not functioning optimally. So it's kind of like a ball joint or a tie rod end or something that is always clicking, you know? I mean, it, it just doesn't, it's not freely moving because it's a little bit out of alignment. Because I know my feet also pronate yep. in. Yep. So between the pronation and the orthotics. But I have started going barefoot now, mm -hmm. inside more, yeah. and my feet are getting stronger. Yeah. I notice that, I, I make myself do it. Yep. I had just recently, um, I, I had a friend that had plantar fasciitis and I'd showed her some stretches and stuff a long time ago. And 
we were, she, she lived down in uh, central Wisconsin, down there south of Ashland. Um, what's that little town begins with an M? It was just in the news lately. But she, um, I had ran into her one time, we wound up getting together and um, she had mentioned that she no longer had her plantar fasciitis. She had been to a rainbow gathering and she had parked her tent up on top of this hill. And then the gatherings place was down below and it was rainy and the weather was really bad. So she was going barefoot all the time and she kept walking up and down that hill barefoot and she was gripping and there again, the strengthening that came from clawing her way up that hillside made her muscles strong enough that it took care of her plantar fasciitis. So that was, I thought, wow, okay, I could see that. I mean, I thought it was amazing, but I could understand it. About two, three months ago, I was working with a guy and he told me the same thing. He wasn't at a rainbow gathering, but he had been going barefoot someplace where he really had to grip and clutch the earth. Oh, I think he was like an Alaska guide or something. Yeah, I bet you that's who it was as I think about it. And because he was out using his feet like that, his plantar fasciitis went away. You know, so I mean, again, we pave and blacktop everything. We don't really grip and clutch the earth with our feet. And so, again, it's just a, a cultural, social weakening of our tissue because we're not using it like it was... I'm going to say designed and meant to be used, okay? And so, um, so now bunions, I've had a bunion going, keeping that at bay for quite a few years now. And when I first started to treat it, I treat bunions, I was questioning, well, how do they form? Well, again, I believe it's from the tension that develops in our shin, because what does it do? The tension goes into the tendons, and then the tendons are going to pull and then because we wear shoes and stuff, instead of it pulling up, it kind of pulls it over. Now, I also recently read where this is being pulled out. So now I'm kind of thinking about that, but I find that we are pretty weak. There's a muscle right here that actually will spread your toe apart. So see, I can barely, I had to play with that. I don't know, did anybody ever see the movie Kill Bill? Okay. <laughs> well, there was a point there where uh, Uma Thurman had to get her toes to move and she was just willing her toes to move. And so I thought about that when I was trying to feel for the muscle that goes right here and see I, there it popped a little bit, but see, just to turn that muscle on to pull my toe out like that. It's called adductor, abductor, um, longus and it attaches and it pulls the toe out. I never even knew it existed. And so it, I've been playing with that and I can now, as you can see, I can kind of spread, I can spread my baby toe farther than the big toe, but I still play with it often. And the other thing that I've learned, um, one of my PT colleagues, um, we were teaching a chronic pain class up in the reservation and she was teaching a little yoga segment and she taught us about lacing our fingers between our toes. Never thought about that either. And I tried it in class with dry fingers. Woohoo! Don't do it. It was most uncomfortable. So I thought, well, I like the idea. So when I showered the next morning, my soapy hands, I started lacing them in there and I could get them up to the first knuckles. And then I kept doing it, you know, every time. And then pretty soon I was up to the, I could get my fingers in between my toes all the way up on the bottom. And then I'd start wiggling my toes and, and moving my feet. And then I thought, okay, well, then I started coming down from the top. And again, it took me stages. I got up to the first knuckles and now I can get all the way up and, and I can go inside, underside. And then I even take in, when I do that, I kind of kick my leg up here to get a little hamstring stretch too. So I'm a weirdo when it comes to trying to take care of and apply this stuff. So that's why I say challenging. One, it's working on balance. And two, it's working on a hamstring stretch. And then again, I also heard, um, I was looking at some uh, thing on, the, on YouTube or something about these uh, hamstring stretches in, in this one 
guru out west was talking about had your feet up on the windowsill and you were contracting the muscle of the quad and that, well, there's your reciprocal inhibition again. Turn this on to release this as you're moving into the stretch. And so again, I play around with that stuff because my hamstrings are probably the tightest in my body. You know, I can kick my own butt so nobody else has to, but you know, I have a hard time touching the floor. My wife even says, I can't believe you can't touch the floor, you know? You're, yeah, so anyways. Ah, grasshopperette. It's to spread those toes and stretch the muscles that are in between. We got muscles that bring our fingers and our toes together. We call them lumbricals. And they're just tiny little muscles that go off to each side. And so it's, it, you just, you're just spreading and opening up the feet a little bit more, which then, um, Norton's neuroma or Morton's neuromas, okay, it's where the nerve gets pinched and it starts swelling. Well, why is it getting pinched? It's getting pinched between tight muscles in our feet because we don't really spread them out that much. And so I, ever since I've been, I do that every time I shower and it, it's just, it feels really good. And to be able to lace them in there and wiggle my toes and stuff. You'll be surprised, but it's, you gotta work at it a little bit. So between crunching the feet, working on that supination, kind of rolling the ankles out, and then uh, spreading the webs of the toes and, and um, you know, loosening things up, self-massage. I mean, massage goes a long way. You feel around and find out where are those muscles tight and tender and you'll work on them. You can use little rollers. I've got a couple little tools that I use when I really need to. But one of the tools that I realized one day, I think I had blown up a portion of my hand, um, calf. I was messing around with my son. I had two boys that played in bands and we were over someplace in Superior and the youngest boy was playing and the oldest boy was there and it's heavier music. so. Just joking around, I kind of slammed into him like a little slam dance. I thought somebody kicked me in the calf. I looked around and there's nobody behind me. I thought, oh man, so I had to walk up to the wall and I just stood there and it just started throbbing and aching and I'm thinking, what the heck is that now? Next day it was all black and blue down into my ankle and stuff. So I must have, when I pushed off, popped a few of those muscle bundles, okay? And so I had some internal bleeding. And, um, and so then, you know, I just gently nursed it and stretched it and loosened it up and the pain went away and I got my function back and everything. Well, my dad was in the hospital having a surgery and he was in intensive care and we were sitting, had to get out of there. And I usually will sit and cross my leg over like this. So that day I thought, hmm, see again, I always cross my right leg over my left. Let's try the other one. I went like that and boom, I almost went through the ceiling. My knee pushed on a part of that calf and it hurt like crazy. And I thought, oh, oh, okay. So then I just turned my knee into a massage tool and I just gently worked on that calf on my kneecap until the pain went away and I loosened it up. So, I mean, massage has been around for millennia because it's just increasing blood flow and teasing out tension in those fibers. It's like working out a snarl in your hair or your beard, okay? You gotta work it out. It doesn't happen by itself. So massage your muscles, feel around. If you feel a tight, tender bundle, that one, pay attention to it because it's on the verge of potentially giving you a hard time, all right? And again, that's personal experience. I got one right here still from doing some push-ups, but the reason that it's still irritable is that again, when we look at this picture right here, look at how many bundles are in the muscle. And what we do is we tend to use the same bundle for repetitive motions, all right? And so reaching, okay, how many, how many bundles am I gonna use to, to feed myself every bite? You know, it's not a lot of weight, but it's still using the same group to get my hand from here to here. 
okay? And so those bundles will get tight, and when they get tender, now they're in a state of dysfunction, and you want to kind of massage them and stretch them, and when I did that, then I had to find just the right position of rotating my hand and arm so that I could feel that I was right on that bundle to stretch it out, and then it, it couldn't hurt. But it felt like somebody stabbed me with an ice pick, just boom. And that was just from doing some push-ups one time, playing around with that for a while. So um, you see how I keep kind of going back to the principles of stretching, strengthening, and stabilization, and then the sliding filament theory to release those tensions in those, those little sarcomeres, and then the use of reciprocal inhibition, which is occurring in our body is all the time. And you just turn that around instead of working against you, it's working for you to relax a muscle and to start balancing out those natural imbalances. So just to carry over with that lower cross pattern again, tight, tight, weak, weak, we get an upper cross pattern with tight through the chest, weak through the upper back, tight through the neck and weak through the deep neck flexors. So we get tight, tight, weak, weak right up here. And there it is, that forward head posture. For every inch the ears forward of the shoulder, you're adding 15 to 30 pounds of tension to those muscles back there. So just the simple uh, alignment tool of standing with your back to the wall, little pelvic tilt so that you only get your first knuckles in and uh, chin down, head back, there's our alignment. You know, I can stand like this for a while, but if it starts to bug me, I just do my alignment, and there I am. I can stand there until gravity pulls me back into this position, because gravity's not giving up. All right, let's see now. I think, was there any other thing that, uh, I was looking at my first page here a second to see because, oh yeah. So we touched on a couple of the things, plantar fasciitis, bunions, tenosynovitis. Have you ever had pain on the top of your foot right here? Okay. If you do, the first thing you want to do is go into that toe drag stretch, I call it, where you just let your toes curl because What's happening is that, as you look at this picture, you can see these little blue little pillows, all right? Those are fluid-filled little sheaths that we call synovial sheaths, and they're fluid-filled to reduce friction where these tendons are, are passing underneath the retinaculum. So those little white straps are straps that keep the tendon from just bowstringing across. And we have them in our wrists too. Otherwise, if I tried to move my wrist back, if they weren't right here, the tendon would just go poing just like the cross. And so that's what happens. And if the shin muscle gets too tight, again, you increase friction with your movements and then that will start to swell and it'll start to give you pain. And it's generally a chemical pain because it's just inflammation and irritation there. And so that's the first thing I would do, whether you do it that way, or you can, here you can combine a shin stretch with your rectus femoris stretch, and now you're co you know, um, covering two bases with that. And that's one thing that I really like to do too, is efficiency. I mean, if I'm gonna do something, I can just do it here, but if I do it here, now I get a shin stretch and a quad stretch at the same time. And so taking that to the front side, if I do my calf stretch and then I kind of tilt my pelvis back using the six pack that you're developing with your sit back, you then tilt the pelvis back and now I got my calf stretch going and a hip flexor stretch going at the same time. So now you're covering two bases with just one movement, okay? But there's that present moment consciousness. You can just think about that, but if you add this little component, now I feel the stretch into the front, okay? And then the same with this one, you stretch this outer side, you add a little arm over your head, now you're stretching all your latissimus dorsi, 
your quadratus lumborum, some of your intercostal muscles, half of your rectus femoris or your rectus abdominis, your back extensor on that side, and then you just lace her over and you do that again. So ballerinas are flexible because they do all that stuff all the time, right? And it's all full body motions. And so that's why I say just fun, make it fun. Don't think of it as work. Dancing in the kitchen to a fun song that comes on is, is a fun activity and it'll show you where your limitations lie. And then you ju uh, just address them, you know? Stretching, strengthening, and stabilization. Okay. All right, let's see if there's one more here. Achilles tendonitis. That's another common one. That's where this calf muscle gets too tight and it's pulling right here on the attachment and that can start to break down a little bit. I've treated that in the past. It becomes swollen and a nodule and very uncomfortable. And guess what? It's relaxing the calf muscle tension and lengthening that muscle. And then I would say, Again, turn on your shin muscle there. Do a little foot, you know, these uh, ankle pumps to kind of turn that on and turn that off, okay? But by all means, don't ignore it because those ones can take a little while too because tendons don't heal as fast as muscle. Tendons are white because they don't have a lot of blood flow through them. Muscles are red because they're full of vessels to, to, for that fuel and oxygen to get in there. And so tendons and ligaments, they'll tend to heal a lot slower when you really irritate them, which is why plantar fasciitis can be such a bear because it's more tendinous, it's fascia that is very dense and thick and so it doesn't heal very fast. So when you have any type of a, a tendonitis someplace, like tennis elbow for instance, I've had that, golfer's elbow digging the,